Welcome to our online worship. Whoever you are and wherever you're from, you are very welcome. We're continuing our series of sermons looking at some passages from Mark's Gospel. Over these few weeks, we're seeing the final stages of Jesus' public ministry, and we're seeing how he entered the city of Jerusalem, even though he knew it was going to lead to his suffering and to his death. And through it all, we're able to observe his relationship with his disciples and see what we 21st century disciples can learn from what he taught them through his words and his actions and from his patience with them, despite their many failings. We begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, by your Holy Spirit, help us to be attentive to your word, to grow as disciples of Jesus, and to lift our hearts to you in worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
today's first reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 6 and it's verses 6 to 10 and then 17 to 19. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6 starting at verse 6. Of course there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. And then from verse 17. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. And our gospel reading is from Mark as we continue in this series of Mark's gospel. And today we're reading Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, This poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But as we approach um, this um, this story about the widow and her offering, shall we pray for God to help us? Almighty God, we thank you for your word, for all it reveals to us. And so now would you open our hearts and our minds as we seek you in this passage today. Help us to hear from you and to act on what we hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of reading a very well-known story and suddenly seeing something totally different in it. Well, that has been my experience with this passage this week. Um, so a story that lots of us will have heard many times before, something we refer to sometimes. Um, this passage is, is known as the widow's might or the widow's offering. We refer to it sometimes in the shorthand um, in church. It's a classic Sunday school type story. And therefore it's one that perhaps we already think we know what what it means. For me, I've always been taught that this story is praising the widow for her offering, for her sacrificial giving. Jesus pointing out what an incredible sacrifice she's making of generosity. Perhaps that's how you've heard this story taught too. Or perhaps, in fact, this story is new to you. You've not heard this this before. And I wonder then what initially jumps out at you as we read it um, in July 2022 in the midst of all that's happening here. Well, on the face of it, that that reading that I have inherited of this passage is, is kind of what happens Jesus sits himself down in the treasury. There are people bringing their offerings into the temple. And of course, that was part of Jewish worship was these particular offerings that should be given financial as well as otherwise. And we read in some of the historians of the first century of the the time when Jesus was on earth about how there were people who were rich within the Jewish community, who were tradespeople or um, owned land, who would have had great riches that they could bring in as part of their offering. And so that's all going on. And then in amongst all of that offering that's happening, all these riches that are being poured out into the temple, along comes a widow, someone without financial stability and security, someone who's dependent on others for their well-being and for their looking after. 
and she puts in some tiny pieces of metal that amount to the cost of about a penny and she puts that in the offering so small compared to what everyone else is giving and Jesus calls his disciples round. he uses her as an example and says look this woman while everyone gives in their riches this woman gives everything that she has the very last of it And on first glance, or at least as I received this story when I was younger, Jesus seems to be praising this woman. Look at what she's doing. Isn't it amazing? But then I read this more closely this week. And I wonder, I had some wonderings about what's going on in this passage. Because, of course, we read this passage in the midst of all that's going on in our world at the moment of political upheaval of a cost of living crisis affecting so many, of inequality growing, of people needing to use food banks on a more and more often. We as a church support the work of CAT, Christians Against Poverty, and we know that there are many in Ely who need that support to get out of debt, who don't find themselves with lots of financial resources, not just outside of the church, but within it, of course, as well. And some of us may find ourselves in that position. And it made me wonder, is Jesus really praising somebody being in that position where all they have left is a penny? That doesn't sound so much like the God that I know. And I thought too about other ways in which we give. People who burn out by giving so much to others, by doing all the looking after, so much pastoral care. I thought about those who had to work throughout the pandemic, people cleaning and caring, often, more often from black and Asian communities, more often women than men, giving themselves, sacrificing themselves, despite having little resource compared to many of us who were able to be in our homes and able to keep away from those who were unwell. Again, does Jesus really praising a society in which people have to give of themselves so sacrificially in that way? And then that made me think about Jesus himself, about how we're told that it's Jesus who made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We're told that Jesus poured himself out on the cross for us, that Jesus has paid the price, has paid the price of all the consequences of our sin and injustice and evil in the world. But it's not our job to take that on ourselves because Jesus has already done it. We're offered new life in him. Not a life that is full of this kind of being weighed down and oppressed that the widow seems to have been facing in this passage. I thought too about that verse that says we're to give cheerfully and we read that word cheerfully and think about a fullness of our character, about how generosity giving us life. And as I read this passage, as I hear of it, a widow giving the last that she has, everything that she's got, I wonder, is there life there or is there a kind of desperation, a kind of giving up? I wondered, is this widow really giving out of generosity or is this a desperate last act to try and find some kind of favour because nothing else is working and this is all that she's got? So I had all these questions about this passage, this story that I've read many times and just taken from a particular perspective suddenly became problematic and confusing. And I wondered, what is Jesus really saying here? And so it was an encouragement to find, as I turned to one of the commentaries on Mark's gospel, this, these same questions being asked. And as I read, a question was raised um, in one of one of the commentaries on Mark that I was reading, which was this. Is Jesus really praising this woman's giving or is his statement one of lament? Let's hear again what Jesus actually says in our translation of it. It says he called his disciples and said to them, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. 
as we hear that again, perhaps you notice with me that there isn't a sense of praise here. There isn't a lauding of this person's generosity. In fact, very little that's positive is actually said in this statement. And so I wonder if instead of praising this woman's act of generosity, if that's what it is, actually what's happening here is Jesus is lamenting the place in which this community finds itself. He's lamenting the fact that this woman finds herself at a place where all that she has left is a penny. If we turn back just a few verses um, in Mark chapter 12, we find Jesus speaking against the scribes, particularly on this issue. He's, as we've heard, in the, in the synagogue, around the temple, where the treasury is. And he's saying, beware of the, the scribes who want to walk around in long robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the places of honour. He says, those scribes, they devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers, and that they will receive condemnation. So directly before this encounter with this widow as she gives her money, we have Jesus saying, actually, those religious people, those people that think they know what they're doing, the scribes, the scholars, actually, they're taking away the places of shelter for these vulnerable women who find themselves as widows. They have all this outward religiosity and these long prayers, but actually they're acting in a way which is unjust. And so as we read on, perhaps these two parts of this passage are actually connected, that, that the outworking, the consequence of the way the scribes, the religious people are acting, is that it puts people like this widow in a place where all there, in, all there is left is a penny. And so Jesus responds not in praising her generosity, but in continuing to lament the situation the society finds it in. Lamenting that while some can give lots and have so much more left over, there are others who have nothing, despite the fact they are the ones that Jewish law in fact said should be protected and looked after. That this, this centre of so much of the law that we find in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, is about the protection of those who find themselves without financial means, without protection, without shelter. And yet here, that is not what is happening. And instead we find this defenceless woman with only a penny left to give. That for me is a totally new way to look at this passage. Jesus lamenting the way things are, as opposed to praising this seemingly over the top sacrifice, this act of desperation. And so if that's the case, what might this passage say to us as we listen and we read today? Firstly, for those of us who might find ourselves in the position that this widow is in, for those of us who find ourselves without enough to get what we need, for those of us trodden down by the way that society is. Well, Jesus laments with those people. He mourns with them. He cries out about the unfairness of it and the injustice of it. He sees you. He sees that position. And in that, there's a lack of shame. Our society so often can shame those who find themselves without enough to make ends meet. And yet here Jesus does not shame, but he gets down alongside that person. He speaks out on their behalf. He advocates for them and he notices where they are. And so if that's us today, or if that's someone we know, can we speak that word of encouragement? That God isn't going to leave us on our own in that place, but is there beside us? Is there lamenting with us, crying out for us? Secondly, I think there's a check here for those of us who do have some resources, whether that's a little or whether that's a lot, about how we treat those who find themselves in this position. What expectations are we placing on people? The situation that the Jewish community found itself in, in this case, was that those scribes and religious scholars were putting more and more laws on what people needed to do, were building up these expectations that really revolved around what they had and what they could do, the resources apparent to them. And then they expected that of everybody else. And I wonder if we do that too. 
if when we're the ones that have resource, whether it be financial or something else, we then expect that of everybody else without really seeing the position that people are in. Thinking about this reminded me of a wrestle that I had, um, particularly as a student moving from home um, to Cambridge, where I went to university. My parents, uh, my dad was a GP, my mum was trained as a doctor and then um, retrained as a, as a therapist and worked for, for social care and the NHS. And in the town that I grew up in, that made us really rich. We were some, had some of the most resources and I carried a sense of, of guilt and privilege and, and found that really uncomfortable at times. It was a, a difficult place to be in. Um, and there's, there's lots more to say about that at another time perhaps. And then I went to university and I moved to Cambridge. And um, as many of you know, Cambridge is a place where there is lots of affluence. There is also injustice, but the people I was exposed to suddenly did not see me as the rich girl, but in fact, pretty normal, actually fairly common as it went. And it continues to, to be something I wrestle with, this positioning of ourselves, of this relativity of who's rich and who's poor. And, um, what resources do people have? And I think something I've often reflected on is, is what is it we have in front of us that we can use? What is, what is in our patch? What have we been given by God that we can use? And living up to that and listening to God and discerning that and taking those actions in our own lives, rather than looking to others and expecting of them, allowing others to discern that for themselves and make it work. And that can go the other way as well. Sometimes we put pressure on ourselves to live up to what it looks like everyone else is doing or to live up to what the religious leaders of our day, whatever they may be, whether that's within church or outside of it, we can put pressure on ourselves and expect so much of ourselves, expect to live up to something we see others doing, but not recognise that the sacrifice we're making is enough, that we're doing the best that we can with the resources that we have. And so there's a check and balance here. What do we expect of others? What pressure do we put on them that actually we should be really paying attention to mostly ourselves? And how do we heap pressure on ourselves? How do we expect something of ourselves that might not be possible? And instead, again, open handedly say to God, well, what is it you want me to do with what I have? Focusing on that rather than on looking to our left and our right in comparison. And thirdly, maybe some of us find ourselves in the position of those scribes, those who have power, those who have financial resources, those who can so easily fall into this trap of using that money to gain power, of using those resources to heap expectation on others in a way that, that continues these cycles of injustice. Jesus is calling that out in this passage. He's saying we have a role to play in ensuring that things are better. That as we see those who are not doing well in our society, as we see those most affected by the changes in cost of living, we have a role to play in the system that has allowed that to be the case. How we respond to that challenge will be different for different ones of us, but there is a place to start in that second reading we had from 1 Timothy chapter 6 that talks about how we use our money, about getting that right. And perhaps if that's you this morning, spending some time in that passage in 1 Timothy 6, perhaps finding someone that you trust to talk about that with really honestly, that might be a friend that you know will keep you accountable, that might be um, someone at church, um, Chris or Phil or myself or somebody else who you feel you could have that kind of conversation with in a confidential space. It might be finding some, someone else in the community, someone you look up to, a spiritual director or a mentor or a friend, to really think through how are you acting on that challenge. And it is a hard pill to swallow in many ways. In our Western affluence, the fact that we contribute to the oppression and the injustice in the world, but is, it is one that we have to pay attention to and that in this passage, Jesus is calling us into. 
So with Jesus, let's lament at the situation that some find themselves in. Let's be with people in that place. And if we're in that place ourselves, let's receive that affirmation that Jesus is with us, that Jesus laments with us, that Jesus advocates for us. Let's use this balance, this passage as a way to check how we see others and how we see ourselves. What expectations are we putting on people? that really we should be thinking of for ourselves and what expectations might be putting on ourselves that are actually for others. And if we are convicted and challenged by this passage, let's do something about that. Let's seek out a conversation about it. Let's spend some time in scripture. Let's sit down with our finances and think about how we might change them. Let's speak out when we have the means to. Let's support and continue supporting organisations like CAP that help people who find themselves in places of desperation. And let's pray both for those who find themselves struggling financially, but also for those who are complicit in it and for ourselves, that we would have the strength from God and the inspiration from God to move forward. Amen. As we continue to respond um, to that reading from Mark this morning, um, should we pray for our world, for our nation, for our city and our church and for our friends and family? Let's pray. And after each section, 
um, do feel free to join in at home or you might like in fact in the silence to fill in with your own prayers whether in your heart and mind or in fact out loud wherever you find yourself this morning so let us pray creator god we thank you for the world in which we live as we find ourselves in the midst of some really hot weather we pray god particularly for those around the world for whom too much heat is a real problem remembering especially those who don't have the resources to look after themselves well in these these weather conditions We pray to you for other places in which the effects of our climate change are having a real impact. We pray for places of conflict, thinking of course of the Ukraine, but also of the many others around the world. And God, today we pray particularly for those who are really desperate, for those who are running out, whether it be of money or of food or of water or of energy or of emotional resilience, whatever it is they need. God, we pray that you would intervene, that your people would rise up to act for the good of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this place here in the UK. God, as the costs rise, we pray for those again who find themselves without the resources they need to get by. Whether that is in part their own fault or is just the way that things are at the moment. God, we pray for your compassion and your grace and your provision. We pray that people would know you alongside them. And we pray that our society would move towards a place of justice where people, everyone has all that they need, where there is enough to go around. We pray too, Lord, for our government and particularly for the leadership contest going on within the Conservative Party. Lord God, would you give your vision to those who lead us? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, God, for our city here in Ely and for the villages that surround it. Lord God, help us to notice those who, like this widow, find themselves at their end. Help us to be a community which rallies around those people, which does not let people get to points of desperation. And we pray for whatever needs come to mind for us in our city today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray to you for our church, for St Mary's and Christ Church. Lord, we thank you for the provision that you have given us and we pray that we would use it well to uphold and empower others. We pray particularly for the work of Christians against poverty that you would give your strength and your resources to all who help make that happen and all who engage with their services. And we pray you would give us courage and strength as we seek to follow in your way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our family and friends and in a moment of silence, do you bring before God those people who are close to you that you are want to pray for this morning, whether in thanksgiving or in asking on their behalf?
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we pray for ourselves. Lord God, help us to respond to your call on our lives. Not just in our thoughts and our beliefs, but in our actions, with our money, with our relationships, with our time and our gifts. God, help us to find that life that we are promised in you. And we bring before you, God, all our needs for today and for the week ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so you might like to join in with the Lord's Prayer as we pray together in our scattered times and spaces. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God of justice, Savior to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and not to be served. Jesus, you have called us. Fill us up.